Thanks everybody for coming. Very excited today to have Dr. Emily, Emily Capron here to tell us about her work with ice trucks and lost other good things. So without further ado. <laughs> okay, good evening everyone. Thanks for inviting me to give this talk tonight. So um, I'm gonna try to give you uh, some insight about the research field I'm interested in and the sort of scientific question we are we're trying to, to answer by uh, drawing and analyzing ice cores in Greenland and uh, in Antarctica. Uh, so my talk will be divided into two parts. First, I'll give you some general information about ice cores, uh, how they, why we analyze them, what sort of information they provide to the scientific community, and then I'll tell you a little bit more about my specific work that was about trying to determine how warm were the Earth during the last interglacial, which was a warm time period that occurred about 130,000 years ago. And then I uh, would like to, let you, to tell you a little bit about how it's like to be in Greenland and in Antarctica to ice cores, because I've been lucky to one of two uh, campaigns uh, to actually uh, drill ice cores uh, over there. So this is just to give you a flavor, is where I've been living for two months in a row with uh, seven uh, people uh, about three years ago uh, in Antarctica. Okay, so uh, by doing ice cores and analyzing them in Greenland and in Antarctica, we get information about past climate changes. Uh, why it is important to know about past climate change is because it basically gives us an idea of what sort of change the Earth is capable of. So we better understand the mechanisms that are involved in climate changes and so it helps us to understand the environment we are currently living in. And it also helps us to better predict how it's going to evolve uh, in the future. And uh, how I thought I should give us information about past climate. So this is a very schematic sketch of an ice sheet. Basically, you have the ice sheet and you have the snow that falls and that falls at the surface. And so it progressively accumulates. The snow gets compressed under its own weight and it gets buried. But the thing is that each layer of ice, well, I guess I could show you here, it gets compressed and progressively the snow transforms into ice, but each layer of ice is going to record information about the environment and the climate at the time it deposited at the surface. Uh, and at the same time, actually, in the snow, there's also some air that circulates, and eventually when the snow transforms into ice, the air gets enclosed into air levels. And that's what actually you can see uh, here on, the, on this photo. Um, and so it's like a little time, time capsule, basically. So it means that when we drill an ice core through the ice sheet, could be up to almost four kilometers, we retrieve a history of the evolution of the climate and the environment in the past. So basically, what sort of information do we get? So here, this is just a, a photo of a slice of ice that has been put under a microscope. And you can see here the ice crystals. So on the ice itself, what we do is that we melt the ice, and on the liquid water, we do all sorts of analysis, but especially we look at the different forms of the water molecules. We look at what we call the water isotopes. And uh, by looking at the ratio between the heavy and the light molecule of water, we get information about the, the temperature at the surface, at the site where we've been drilling the ice core. So this is quite a major information we get. We get an evolution of the surface temperature. We get also information about how much it's been uh, snowing uh, through time. Then the big black dots that you have here are the air bubbles. And so, as I said, it's a tiny little time capsule of the atmospheric composition in the past. And on it, we measure a lot of different gases, but most specifically, we measure the greenhouse gas. So we measure CO2, we measure methane. And that's what makes our score so precious as a paleoclimatic archive. It's the only archive that gives us uh, information about the evolution of the greenhouse gas in the atmosphere. And and then here you have those little uh, black dots, which are basically impurities, which are aerosols. And, uh, and so we can measure all sorts of chemical components. Uh, basically, we measure all these different uh, impurities to get information more about the environment, at it, at, um, actually. Uh, if we identify where the dust is coming from in the ice, we can have an information about how the air masses above, above Antarctica are going to circulate. So for instance, we know that the dust in Greenland comes from Asia. Um, um, we get also information about the extent of the sea ice in the past. Um, and here on this section, well, on this section of ice cores that you see here, you have these big black layers, which is actually volcanic ash. 
So icebergs are also very nice to actually identify volcanic eruption. Um, and actually, having those volcanic uh, eruptions are also very precious to be able to date the ice core. Because if in our uh, uh, historical records, we know and we identified which volcanic eruption it was, we are able to give a precise date of uh, the depths uh, where we actually find this, uh, this ash layer. So this is roughly the sort of information uh, we get. Um, ice core science is quite young. It started in the late in the late 50s. And since then, many ice cores have been drilled. And here are the, let's say, the most uh, important ice cores that have been done in Greenland, uh, so in the Northern Hemisphere, and, and in Antarctica in the Southern, uh, the southern Hemisphere. Uh, for a long time, people were very excited about trying to get the oldest ice possible. And for that, it was necessary to go in East Antarctica, because it's where we have um, the ice sheet that is the thicker, so up to four kilometers. And it doesn't snow much year after year, which means that by drilling through the four kilometer, we could get very, very old ice. And at Domsi, we got the oldest ice that we have at the moment, that is 800,000 years old. Um, and there is a lot of work going on because we are hoping to get ice that is as old as one million year. But this is ongoing project and that may take many years to actually find the right site to, to drill. Uh, the, the good ice core. Um, but at best, we're also very interested in, um, so past the British Antarctic Survey, um, uh, we're very interested in looking at um, ice cores that we can drill in, uh, in the Antarctic Peninsula. So those ice cores are not as deep as in East Antarctica, and they don't go back that far uh, in time. However, they are interesting because at the moment, we see that the Antarctic Peninsula is one of the places on Earth that is reacting the fastest to global warming. So we would like to know at least how it was, how it evolved over, let's say, the last 2,000 of years. So that's why we're trying to, to go in this area as well. And it's convenient as well because the British Antarctic Survey has some research station uh, in this area. So it's quite convenient in terms of logistics. But what I'd like to show you now is this oldest ice record that we got at uh, at the site called Domsi, it's the Epica Domsi ice core. Maybe you have heard of, of this record. Um, so here you have a graph that goes from uh, the right, the time goes from the right uh, to the left. So it was 800,000 years ago, and this is today. And the evolution of this black curve that you see here, it's the, uh, the variation of Antarctic temperature relative to uh, today over the last 800,000 of years. So it's been measured on, on the ice itself. And you can see that over the last 800,000 of years, the climate has been varying with an amplitude of about 10 degrees, with wind going from warm periods to warm cold periods to warm warm periods to warm cold periods, etc. 20,000 years ago here, you have what we call the, the ice age, the last ice age, so that's the last glacial period. And 11,000 years ago, we started to be in a warm period, so today we are in an interglacial period. Um, this evolution of the climate over at least the last 800,000 of years, it's completely due to natural variability. It's linked to the position of the Earth around the sun that is changing, and so it's going to change the amount of energy that arrives at the surface of Earth, and so it's going to change uh, basically the temperature at the surface. Um, and then in parallel, I told you that we have the air that is trapped in the ice, so we can measure the CO2 concentration and have in parallel a record of the CO2 concentration. And when this record came out, it was a really, really big result for the scientific community because it was the first time we could actually show really how tight was the link between CO2 concentration in the atmosphere and the temperature. Because you can see that we have high level of CO2 during warm time periods, lower level of CO2 during colder uh, time periods. So that was one thing. And then the second thing is that, that is interesting and I would say shocking to actually look at is that if I put the CO2 concentration today in the atmosphere, we are actually here. So you can see that it's almost the amplitude of the CO2 increase over the last just 150 years is the same as the amplitude, even more actually, that the amplitude of change from when we go from an ice age to today. And you have to imagine that the, the 
Earth were really looking different uh, during the last ice age. There were glaciers above Scotland and above uh, all Canada and America. But right now we're going towards the other way around. Um, so yeah, that's that's really shocking how fast this um, this increase has been uh, has been happening. And um, what is uh, what is interesting as well is that we can measure the different form of the carbon molecule, and it tells us that this extra CO2 in the atmosphere is actually not from uh, natural origin, but coming from uh, the human activities. So this is just to give you uh, an idea of sort of how ice core science actually fits in the current debate about uh, global warming and whether we should believe it or not. It's, it's just not about believing it or not believing it. It's just about looking at the facts. Um, so now I'd like to be a little less uh, general and tell you a little bit about my own work. Um, I've been involved over the last uh, couple of years in some projects to look at um, a time period that is just the last interglacial. So we're actually going to look at this warm time period that occurred 130,000 years ago. And I, I, I was trying to determine how warm it was. And I'm going to try to explain to, to you and convince you that it's, it's interesting to actually look at this time period. And especially, I've been looking at the polar and the subpolar region, uh, mostly. So why it is of interest to actually focus on those regions? It's because there are really weaknesses of climate change. Um, I actually uh, mentioned it briefly earlier, but in the Arctic and in the Antarctic Peninsula, it's where we have the fastest warming over the last 150 years. You can see it here, it's the graph represents basically the warming trend since the beginning of the 19th century. And so because those regions are very sensitive to climate change, there are also actors in this climate change. So for instance, you may have heard of the Intergovernmental uh, Panel for Climate Change that uh, produce records every four or five years about what is the state of our knowledge about uh, climate and climate change. And they report that over the last two decades, both Greenland and Antarctica have been losing ice. And it means that in the future, it's going to contribute to uh, sea level rise. So in that way, for instance, those regions act as uh, uh, impacting uh, the climate. So what we want is to look at past one time period and we want to uh, understand at that time how the ice sheet, Greenland and Antarctica, were actually behaving. Whether they were melting, whether they were not melting. Because it helped us to be basically better assess the likely contribution of both Greenland and Antarctica under a warmer climate in the future. Um, and what is great as well in those regions is that we can get archives of past climatic variation. So I told you about the ice core, I told you we can get information about the air temperature above Antarctica, but we can also drill sediment core at the bottom of ocean seafloor, and by analyzing um, the microorganisms that are uh, buried in those sediments by doing some geochemical uh, analysis, we get information about, for instance, sea surface temperature. So at the same time, we can have information about the polar ice sheet and also the climate around the surrounding ocean. Um, so, um, the last interglacial, why in particular this time period? So, this is now uh, familiar to you. Uh, this graph is going from 140,000 years to today, and this is the last interglacial. Um, it's interesting to look at this time period in particular because, first, it's free from any human impact. So, it's so, sort of a natural experiment where we can, uh, that we can use to uh, compare uh, with the present interglacial and what we see for the present interglacial. Um, and so, we can use it as a benchmark to test Earth system models that are used to understand uh, our current climate and also for future prediction. So, Earth system models in space are basically a, mathematic, a mathematical representation of the climate system. And so it's a lot of equations that are put in, put in that uh, model to represent physical processes, uh, biological processes, or chem chemical processes. Um, so <coughs> it's a time period that is interesting. But at the moment, well, at least until I, uh, the work I did, we didn't have a satisfactory representation of the temporal evolution of that climate, especially in the surrounding ocean. So it was basically quite hard to use it as a good constraint for uh, climate modeling. Uh, what was interesting during that time period is that in Antarctica, 
we can record that it was at least five degrees warmer than today. It was completely natural, natural climate variability, but it was warmer than today. And from the federal data, we know that the sea level was higher by about five to nine meters, which means that both Greenland and Antarctica were melting uh, at that time. So by constraining precisely the evolution of the climate through this time period, we can help to assess the effect of warmer than present day climate on the polar ice. So uh, what, what did I do? Well, I didn't do it alone, actually. What we did uh, was to uh, produce a data synthesis of the vast temperature changes during that time period. Because basically, there are already, there's a lot of records that were already existing that have been published over the last decades. But no one has been putting them all together to try to create sort of a big picture of the climatic uh, variation. And why no one did that? It was just because it was quite challenging to be able to date precisely those paleoclimatic records in order to be able to compare precisely the climatic variations from one place to the other, from ice core record to marine sediment core records. So that was a big challenge of our work. So what we did is that we compiled 47 existing uh, temperature records in the Northern Hemisphere and here in the Southern Hemisphere. Here we're quite biased. Basically, we are basically in the North Atlantic region because in the Pacific there's just no, not many uh, paleoclimatic records that have been uh, retrieved. Um, and then we tried to develop a, um, a strategy to, to, de to have a common chronology uh, between all these different records to be able to compare them and to have this more global picture of what happened in the polar and the subpolar region. And so from that, we were able to uh, produce time slices throughout the mass integration. So basically here you have four snapshots. You have the northern hemisphere all the time here and the southern hemisphere here. We, had, we basically built a snapshot at 130,000 years. So we knew roughly that at that time we should be able to capture the beginning, the entrance into this warm time period. Then we produced two snapshots at 125 and 120,000 years. So representing basically the optimum of the period. And we, we knew that we should be able to capture the end of the last interglacial at about 115,000 years. So basically what you have is that each dot represents a site where we got an information about the climate. When the dot is blue, it means that it was colder than today. It's basically temperature anomalies that are represented. So when it's blue, it was colder than today. When it's red, it was warmer than today. Um, and the size of the dot depends on the amplitude of the temperature difference between a given age and today. So this is actually the first time that we have this sort of time evolving synthesis um, of, of the climate through, through this time period. And that was quite nice because we were able to, um, to, to identify a few important patterns. First, we see that not only in Antarctica, but actually both in the Northern Hemisphere and the Southern Hemisphere, during the optimum of the warm time period, of the, of the last interglacial, it was warmer than today, um, at least by a couple of degrees in the Southern Ocean. In Greenland, it was much, much warmer than today by at least five degrees. Um, and what we, we evidence as well is that Actually, the warming didn't start at the same time at the beginning of the last interglacial because you can see that at 130,000 years, it was warmer than today by a few degrees in the southern hemisphere, but it was still much colder than today in the, the northern hemisphere by almost five, five degrees. So just to be a bit more, uh, to give you a bit more uh, quantitative estimation, in Antarctica, I told you previously, it was five degrees warmer than today. Uh, in Greenland, we had a new ice core that I will tell you a bit more about uh, later on, where we were able to see that it was at least eight degrees warmer than today there. And our work uh, with the surrounding ocean um, enabled to tell that it was at least two degrees warmer than present day. So this is the result of my work. And, and again, you may wonder about, okay, now you have a very nice and detailed picture of what it was 130,000 ago, 130, ago, um, 130, ago. 
And okay, what do you do with that now? Uh, so what we try to do is to compare our climatic reconstruction with some climate model simulation. And only some climate model simulation from models that are also used to do future climate prediction. Because we basically, we, the, we, we think that if the climate model is able to reproduce what happened in the past, it gives us confidence in its ability to reproduce what is going to happen in the future. So basically, we took a climate model simulation for 120,000 years ago, and we superimposed onto it the data synthesis. So the data are the different dots. And at the background, the image at the background is um, the simulation. So again, it's temperature anomaly relative to, uh, to today. Um, and the climate model, it basically it has to be forced by what we think are the dominant uh, forcing that basically is a dominant process that impacts the climate at that time. So I told you uh, like, um, earlier that one, one, one forcing that is very important is the position of the Earth around the sun. And the second forcing that is very important is the greenhouse gas concentration and especially CO2 concentration. So the climate model, it tries to represent the climate at 125,000 years ago when it's actually forced by the condition the greenhouse gas concentration at that time that we know from the ice cores, and by uh, also using the forcing that we put about the position of the Earth around the sun, which is something that we can also uh, reconstruct. And we see that for this time period, actually the model is not doing too bad. It does represent that both in the northern and the southern hemisphere, it was warmer than today by a few degrees, which is what we see in our data, which is nice. However, when we look at 130,000 years ago, so the beginning of the last interglacial, well, we see that a total disagreement between the model and the data. You see that the model doesn't represent that it was warmer than today above Antarctica, and it doesn't represent the fact that it was colder than today in the North Atlantic region, and the opposite actually, it represents that it was warmer than today um, in, in this region, which tell us that with the simulation that we had done at that time, there was something that was missing. We were missing some mechanism that had actually a big influence on the climate at that time. And that was something that was not taken into account. And, um, and so I worked with, um, with a colleague from the University of Bristol who tried to improve her model and who tried to take into account some additional parameter. And, um, and in particular, in addition to the forcing due to the greenhouse gas, and uh, the position of the Earth around the Sun, we started to take into account the fact that at this time period, so I told you it's the beginning of the last interglacial, so it's starting slowly to warm. And what happened is that the big ice sheets, the big northern hemisphere ice sheets are starting to melt. And by melting, they actually release a lot of fresh water into the North Atlantic region. And by releasing fresh water, it's going to disrupt the oceanic circulation. And the oceanic circulation is what is distributing heat between the two hemispheres. So if we change the intensity of this oceanic circulation, we are going to change the warming and the cooling between the two regions. And actually, by taking into account this process in the model, now we obtain a good agreement between the model and, and the data. So, so basically, those data time slices, they represent targets for the climate modeling. And then I hope I somehow convinced you that they are useful and they have implications about trying, helping to improve the climate model simulations. So I'm going to stop now about the science and I'd just like to finish by telling you a little bit how it's like to be in Greenland and, and in Antarctica. So during my PhD, I spent three weeks uh, in Greenland at this camp in North Greenland called me. Uh, NIM was a big international drilling project. Uh, 14 countries were involved and it lasted for about five seasons. So summer after summer, people would come back on camp to, well, first put everything in place and then do, do the drilling. Um, after four, three seasons of drilling, we had uh, two, more than 2,050 meter deep ice cores that would go back to actually the last integration period. It was a really big camp. We had almost 20 to 45 people on camp each summer. Um, this is a standard view all around. 
So not, not much to actually look at. Um, we would hope for some drifts, you know, where we were going skiing to, to hope to that kind of uh, a feeling of, I don't know, <laughs> something. But it was really, really flat, really flat, really white. Uh, so yeah, this is the camp. Here you have this big dome that could fit actually 40 people. Um, it was basically where we were living, where we were eating. And um, here are those tents here are the sleeping tents. And then some very brave people would actually stay in those more smaller uh, tents. Life at Nîmes was pretty comfortable. Uh, this is inside the dome. So it's like a three floor dome. This is the ground floor and we have all the tables. We have this huge and amazing kitchen. We had a chef cooking for us, which was very nice. And here is the second floor. So there's just sofa, uh, TV, and you could watch movie. They even had a sauna actually there. It was a Danish project. Um, um, so yeah, life was pretty comfortable. Um, a lot of turnover, a lot of meeting with a lot of PhD students at the time, I think. Uh, it was very nice to actually network and get to know the people uh, within the community. But I was there for only three weeks. Then, of course, there was a drilling part that we should not forget about. Um, and the drilling was done in a, a big science trench, so like a subsurface trench, because the thing is that we want uh, the ice core to not suffer from any warming or any melting when it comes back at the surface. So we want it to be cold enough. So basically they dig this huge trench that you can see here and the drilling was happening there. So there was this big trench where there was a drilling. So this is a drill that you can see here. Actually you can see there is an ice core inside. And there was another trench where we would do what we call the processing of the ice. So we, once the ice core is back at the surface, we have to log it, we have to indicate where is the top, where is the bottom, we have to get it into different pieces, and a lot of measurements on site were actually done already. Um, so that was how it was uh, looking like uh, at me. But then, when I, um, I started at the British Antarctic Survey, I got involved in another training project that was completely, completely different. We went at a site called Fletcher Promontory, just here uh, in Antarctica, and, and that was our camp. So just by looking at the two photos, you can tell that it, it was very different. Um, well, what was very different, what was great, is that at Fletcher we had a view. Uh, this was actually the view just of our camp. This is the highest mountain um, in Antarctica. Um, but yeah, this place, we were basically seven of us only uh, for two months. Uh, and basically we arrived on the site. There was absolutely nothing. We had to build everything to do the drilling, and then when we left, we had to remove absolutely everything because we would not be able to come back the year after. So that was really, really intense work. Um, those pyramidal tents, so it's like Scott, Scott tent, I guess if you've been to the Polar Museum, you may have seen some of those. Um, there were the tents where we were sleeping in, and we have two, smaller, two, two bigger tents up there, one where we were doing the drilling, considering that it was cold enough at the surface that we could actually drill from the surface, and then and then a, and a living a living tent, um, and we drilled. I mean, of course, it was just one season project, but we also drilled an ice core that was not as deep. It was about six hundred fifty-seven meters, although it still go back to the last interglacial. Um, but yeah, just so you see, it was more. We really had to be very good at various skills, like especially digging skill. We really had to do a lot of digging and a lot of building up uh, the tent. And, uh, and the food was definitely not like at Nîmes because we didn't have any chef, we didn't have any kitchen. All the food was prepared on those primer stove that you see here. So it's really like what Scott was actually using at the time. Uh, and the food was mostly tin food. So this is cheese, actually. And this is probably something like tuna or chicken. I don't know. I don't want to know. I don't want to remember. Um, and we were mostly having dehydrated food, uh, basically. Um, but just it, it, in terms of logistics, it's really used. Just just to give you an idea, everything is coming from those little planes, um, and then the ice core once it's drilled has to actually go back as well through those planes and back to Cambridge, still frozen, of course. So we can be we can uh, be able to do um, the the analysis. So just to give you a bit more of a feeling of the can this sort of project uh, within Bath, I'd like to show you this movie. So, so yeah, we can 
you can see that that was not the project I was on, but it was a similar project at a place called Berkner Island. But again, all the equipment is actually coming from uh, those little uh, twin otters. So it takes about 20, 25 flights to bring all the equipment. Um, so of course, when the weather is like this, there's no plane that is going to uh, come. So you could actually get stuck for a little while. Um, when it's nice and sunny, it's quite great to actually work over there, but when the weather is like that, it really becomes very complicated because everything gets just wet. And as I said, then the main activity on camp is just to dig because you, want, you need to dig everywhere, every tent. On that specific project, they also have this under snow uh, trench to do the drilling. So here you can see the drill that is coming back up at the surface. Typically, um, you had one to 1.5 meter of ice that is drilled at a time. So you can imagine that when we drill 600 meter, it's a lot of up and down uh, the hole, and that's why it takes so much, so much time. So here then you have the drill that goes back up at the surface. The liquid that you see here, it's not water, it's some drilling fluid that is used to help to do the drilling. And now they are actually uh, removing the ice core, well, the, one part of the drill to, to, to get the ice uh, free. So they're going to take out what we call the chips, just just over there. And then Rob now is putting the ice core out. So you see it's about 10 centimeter diameter. And yet it's typically one, one meter section. And once we have once we have that, OK, you, have, you do the processing. You cut the ice into different sections. We use bensos. Uh, and then uh, you have to pack it very well, very carefully, because it's put in those boxes that, are, that then are going to fly back um, to the main research station, and then they are shipped back to Cambridge. And then they're stored in big storage containers um, outside Cambridge, I think near uh, Peterborough. Um, so yeah, that's how it looks like. So now I'd just like to finish my talk with my last slide, just about some take-home messages. Um, yeah, it's just, just it, there's a few things to remember from my talk. Just, just that ice cores from Antarctica and from uh, Greenland are recording precious information on the evolution of the climate and, uh, and on the atmospheric composition of the environment. Um, what it tells us is that the greenhouse gas concentration in, in the atmosphere has never reached the present day level for at least 800,000 of years. And it really increased at a rate that we've never seen uh, for a long time. Um, and finally, we can use, we use a lot of information from, uh, from the past, but especially looking at past warm time periods, such as the last interglacial, is actually useful when we want to help to improve the climate models that are then used to do uh, future climate prediction. And uh, that's it. <laughs> well, actually, I do have some ice core samples if you'd like to yes. look at them. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if you have any question. Yeah. yeah, maybe could you say a little more about how, how you how you date the ice core samples? Like yeah. how you, yeah. you identify depth with, with mm -hmm. the date? Yes, so that really depends at which site we actually go. So in Greenland, it's very nice because it snows a lot. So actually, we can see the annual layers when we look at the ice core by measuring some parameters that are going to vary from one season to the other we're going to get very nice seasonal cycles. So we can really clearly, in just a visual way, count the layers. So it's very nice. It gives us a very precise and absolute date for the ice core. The it's issue is that, sorry? It's a lot of layers. It's a lot of layers, but, it, but it's the most accurate way to actually date the ice core. The issue is that the deeper we go, the more the layers are compressed. So at some point, it's not possible anymore to identify those layers. And also for deep ice cores in Antarctica, for instance, in central Antarctica, even from the top, it's not possible to see those annual layers because it doesn't snow enough. So then we have to find other way. And so we usually use some models, some glaciological models, that are going to try to predict the speed of the movement of an ice particle through the ice sheet, depending on the temperature and the amount of snow at the surface. So it's basically what we use most commonly to date the oldest ice, the oldest parts of the ice core. Um, it works, but it's, it's not very precise. So we try to find independent way to actually constrain those models. And for instance, 
Um, I, I, I spoke a little bit about ash layers, and as I said, if we are able to date this ash layer, if we know how this the ash layer, it gives us an anchor on the edge of the, of the ice. But that's definitely the very, very challenging things about, um, about ice core. I could just give you a two hour presentation about it, but I'm not sure that you <laughs> of big interest, but uh, but yeah, that that's basically the way we, we do it. And yeah, the best is when we are able to count the layers. Can you tell when the industrial revolution happened in the ice cores? Yeah, yeah. Well, you can you can looking at the CO two concentration, and you can also look at other chemical components, and we can uh, see the pollution pollutant actually variation. Yeah, there's a lot of different parameters that can be measured. In You showed the graphs that it showed like almost the perfect correlation between the CO2 and the temperature. But mm -hmm. you mentioned that um, like the distance from the sun also affects the temperature. Yeah. Could you say a little bit about how much each contributes to that, um, like in the models that you have? For so um, I'm, I'm not sure I, I got your question. But what I can tell you is that, yeah, we have this very nice correlation between CO2 and temperature. But then, yeah, the obvious question is, what is leading what? Whether is it temperature which increased first, or with, with, is it uh, CO2 with, which is increasing first? And there's a lot of ongoing research on that, because it's not so easy to compare CO2 and temperature curve, because one is measured on the ice, the other one is measured from the air level, and there is an offset in the age of the two parameters, because you have to imagine that the air is only trapped when the ice when the, the snow is transforming to ice. So at the time, it's like already a 100 meter of snow, for instance, that may have deposited. So we need to get this offset right and to estimate that right to actually be able to look at this phase relationship between the two. But the result that we have at the moment clearly show that during this deglaciation, so this huge transition between a glacial and interglacial period, it's likely that temperature is starting first because of the change of the position of the Earth around the sun. And because of this warming, the sea ice around the Southern Ocean is going to disappear. And if you remove the sea ice, all the CO2 that is stored in the ocean is going to be released in the atmosphere. So it means that because the CO2 is a greenhouse gas, it's going to amplify the warming that was already happening. So basically, those huge deglaciation that we see, it's because of the position of the energy that arrived at the surface of the Earth. That is, and then it's amplified by the CO2 as well. So I don't know if it answers your question. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, what's the physical phenomenon correlating the isotopes concentration and the temperature? It is, um, it's basically due to the isotopic fractionation. Uh, that, uh, for instance, uh, when you precipitate a, a cloud, uh, the heavy molecule are going to preferentially goes into the precipitation and the light molecule are going to stay in the cloud. And because of, you have to imagine that the snow that falls over, um, over Antarctica, the source of this snow is quite often comes from the lower latitude and it comes from a, um, a vapor mass that condensates above the ocean. And then that, you know, went all the way from the low latitude to the high latitude. And, and during that uh, path, that journey, there's precipitation events occurring. And basically, the higher, well, when you go towards the highest latitude, it's getting colder and colder. And so you're losing the heaviest um, molecule of water. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, and so then by, by measuring we have the ratio uh, on the ice sheet, we can have a, a, nice, uh, a nice correlation. And we know that the coldest it is, the more we're going to lose heavy uh, water molecule somehow. It's a little bit unclear in my explanation. But, but the principle is that it's, it's based yeah, on the fractionation of those different isotopes that preferentially are going to go either in the vapor or either in the precipitation. Okay. And there's calibration uh, by uh, analyzing snow sample at the surface of different places that have a different surface temperature we can actually show a very nice correlation with the evolution of temperature and the isotopic composition of, of the snow. Yeah. Oh, so just one more thing, over um, so over the scale of hundreds of thousands of years, do we have to account for continental drift at all? 
How long um, was Antarctica snow covered? So not, not, not at 800,000 of years, not at the scale of ice cores. Um, but yeah, uh, when you go much further back in time, there's then the drift of, of the continent. And actually when I say that, well, we have never reached that this low CO2 concentration over the last 800,000 of years. That's right. However, we did have such a CO2, high CO2 concentration, but like billions of years ago. And so the configuration of Earth was completely different. The continent were at different places. There was no species, no human, etc. But that ice cores are actually, it sounds old, but it's not old at all considering the age of the Earth and considering how old we can go back by looking, for instance, at marine sediment core records or rock drilling as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. Another very scientific question. What sort of budgets do one of these expeditions have? There's an intensive people somewhere by um, I, I don't have a precise number to, to give you. What I can tell you is that for one kilo of ice, uh, for a project such as a big project like Dome C, one kilo of ice is, I think we made the calculation for some sample that I took to the US, but it was at least something like 700, 800 euros. Uh, and then it's only the drilling, and so yeah, all the money into the drilling and into sending people in, 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 the, in the field. But in addition, you have to take into account the measurements that are extremely expensive. Shipping and I mean the sh the shipping. So I, I shipped <laughs> I shipped how many uh, five or six kilo of ice of ice over to the US, and it cost something like four thousand euros <laughs> because you you send all this ice, but in addition you send a lot of ice and extra ice to make sure that everything gets cold. <laughs> or if you do a shipment that is with a cold uh, like cold truck or something, I actually did one a few months ago, but, but again, it's thousand thousand of euros. But that's why those big projects most of the time are big collaborative projects, because one nation can hardly pay for a big a big project. Nim was, yeah, 14, 14 different countries. Uh, and then also it's good because in terms of measurements, then when the ice comes back uh, in Europe, um, it's split into different sections, and then some labs are going to do those specific measurements, some other labs are going to do this specific measurement. It's quite rare that just one institute is going to do like both the water isotopic measurements, the gas measurements, and the chemistry measurements. So at BAS, for instance, we mostly do the chemistry measurements and the water isotopes measurements. Um, and most of the gas measurements are done in France, in some institutes in France. 